Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another photo mishmash and happy new year. This is our first broadcast of 2019 and I am joined as usual by my good friend and co-host Steve. Hi Steve. Howdy. Happy uh, 2019. I can't believe it's here. I can't believe it's here either. We were just talking before the show went live that uh, this last month has flown by. I think probably most people feel that way. Uh, it's just from Thanksgiving. It's just kind of a mad slog right on through. I was telling you, I dropped my mom off the airport literally just a few hours ago. Um, I had a very nice visit with her and, and just, you know, been enjoying family time. Yeah, this is, uh, I know we were just chatting about this, but uh, basically from Thanksgiving on until last night, uh, we've just been going nonstop. And, and, you know, these are the types of things that looking back, you have these great memories and fun times and they were fun times. But uh, I always, I'm one of these people that needs to just have some time to recharge my batteries and just have quiet time and be on my own or at least with my wife. And last night was just so much fun to just have the house peaceful and quiet as much as you can with a puppy in the house, mm -hmm. uh, which was a whole other mix to the craziness of the end of the year. But I, for one, am super excited to have 2018 in the history books. It was a very rewarding year. It was a good year in many respects, but it was also an extremely difficult year, uh, not for any particular reason. It was just a lot, a lot, a lot going on, and I'm excited about uh, the year ahead. I am too. Uh, you know, I'm kicking the year off with a pretty big trip that I'm a little sad that you're not going to be along on. I'll bring that up every time we talk about it. Um, <laughs> but 2019, I'm, uh, I'm sad too. I'm yeah, sad too. I know you are. Um, and for those who don't know, it's Antarctica. Um, I actually have a little pre-trip right before that. So we're talking just days away. I hop in an airplane, fly off for somewhere for a long weekend and come back and hop in an airplane to go to Antarctica. Uh, so, so on that pre-trip, that's the Patagonia extension basically, right? That's right. Yep. Uh, that you're, you're leading that solo. Is that correct? Or that's correct. It? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think, uh, I mean, not to add salt to the wound, but, uh, had I been going on this tour, I would have loved to have been down there doing the Patagonia extension with you as well. Um, because we, I did this trip, for those who don't know, I did this trip about a year, two years ago. And um, it was kind of a last minute deal. Toby couldn't make it. I was low man on the instructor totem pole at the time and uh, I was able to go. So I just felt very, very fortunate to be able to do uh, Patagonia and Antarctica as uh, it was a small trip and we really didn't need the extra instruction, but we had um, a client who canceled and got reimbursed by his company. So the spot was covered. Anyway, um, I saw an opportunity to let one of our new instructors go in my place. And it's just one of those experiences that if, if there's a chance to go to Antarctica in your lifetime, you should you should go if that's something you want to do you should just do it yeah. and i'm so bummed because i want to go back there with you uh especially because we didn't get to do that trip together mm -hmm. but you know, i understand i understand your yeah. reasons i also every once in a while wonder i saw a video of a ship crossing the drake passage the other day and it was hair raising <laughs> uh, so i also wonder you know is that in the back of your mind at all oh um, that's always that's always in the back of my mind on, on almost every trip that we take where there's some sort of sea nearby i'm always thinking okay am i gonna have to get on a boat which it bums me out that i get seasick because i don't mind being on a boat it's awesome and that's where you access some of these incredible places in the world but i got severely seasick in iceland a few years back and it's really screwed up uh, my head when we when we get on the water. So of that. course that's always that's always on my mind. But I've got good drugs to just knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, J Steve and I are chit chatting here, but uh, we need to take a moment and welcome the chat room for chit chatting with us on your Wednesday afternoon or however when you are watching this, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, most of you are Patreon. Or sorry still doing that even in 2019 most of you are photo enthusiast network members we're so glad you have joined us and um we've been doing a little bit of marketing and the ramp up uh or to towards the end of the year and we need to post a little welcome because we've actually 
uh, significantly grown the group by a good bit. I'm really excited to see some new folks uh, active in the community. I'm really excited to welcome back some folks that have been active in Patreon, like Colette has joined us in chat today. Thank you so much. Um, and if you happen to watch this, you're not a Photo Enthusiast Network member and you want to know how you can get access to Steve and I to ask us questions, even when we don't do this show, maybe you'd like us to see some uh, editing of your photos to give you some Lightroom tips and tricks, plus just a ton more resources, including the weekly Tuesday tips. You can learn more at photorec.tv slash pen to learn more about the Photo Enthusiast Network. And, uh, you know, We'll talk a little bit about photo resolutions a little bit later in the show, and I don't mean the joke of 4,800 by 2,400 or whatever. I mean actual things or goals. Maybe we should call them goals. Photography goals you have for 2019 and how the Photo Enthusiast Network can help you. Uh, um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we wanted to uh, wish everybody who celebrated Christmas, Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Here we are in 2019, no flying cars, no wireless charging of our cameras. Those things disappoint me. They're equal level in my mind. No, uh, no Marty McFly self-lacing Nikes. I know they exist out there, but that's not a regular thing. Yeah, you can't just go buy them. At, yeah, I mean, the, well, if you have Foot Locker dollars, you can, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I was... Uh, I thought we'd be further along with all this this cool stuff by now, but hey, yeah, yeah. we've got our health, so we can't complain. Yeah, uh, looking ahead, uh, you know, it's not too soon to start looking ahead. We have announced a third tour to Alaska in December, so about eleven months from now. Good news gives you lots of time to set up a payment plan and put aside that money to be able to check off seeing the aurora. I know that's on many photographers bucket list, not only to be able to see it, but to photograph it. So uh, we have a link to that in the show notes. Roy, we'll get a link to that in the show notes. Roy, thank you so much for putting the show notes together. You can find all of that at photorec.tv slash MMH. That stands for Mish Mash Highlights. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll... That was, uh, I, I was glad to see, I had a feeling that that was gonna happen, that David was gonna um, add on a third tour because the first one sold out right away. Uh, which creates this uh, this kind of like waiting list that if you get enough people that are interested and legitimately interested, then you can do it back to back. And then you take the people from the waiting list and they can fill in the spots on the second tour. Well, I knew that that one was going pretty quickly too. So uh, I'll just tell people, I don't know how many spots are left, but if that's something that you're interested in doing, man, this this next year is going to be really really cool because it's actually at Frank and Miriam's house for Aurora Bear LLC. Uh, it's not at the yurt where we've done it in the past, which is a great space, but this is going to be much more intimate, a much smaller group. I think 10, 10 photographers and just mm -hmm. a couple instructors, mm -hmm. and you'll really get a lot of hands-on um, education and just be able to kind of collaborate with each other in a smaller group. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do a little bit more of that, get the groups a little bit smaller so that it's just, yeah. it's a really good time. It's easier yeah. to navigate for a few days when you have yeah. less people. Now, the way I heard you describe that, Steve, my typical self, we talk about this almost every time we talk about these trips too. I'd be a little nervous. Oh, we're going to go in a house. It's going to be a small group. People are going <laughs> to want me to talk to them. You know, you really, it is as interactive or as hands-off as you want. And well, I mean, you're watching the show, so hopefully, you know, Steve and I are nice guys. Frank and Miriam, they make us look like, you know, bums. They are just the nicest people. Uh, they're there for you if you need them. Uh, and then, of course, David McKay, he's all right, too, you know. Uh, so don't don't be nervous. Don't be don't feel like there's a level of expectation we have for you. You can show up with your tripod still wrapped in the box and you have never have it taken out. We might practice with you in the hotel a little before we go out into the cold with it. But, you know, that's the level. That's where if you're starting there, that's fine. If you have been to Alaska 15 times and captured the Aurora, what's really awesome about Frank and Miriam's place is kind of the... Um, Kind of vignettes that he has set up the different locations around his property so you have a lot of diversity in the shots they're not all just this horizon with the aurora uh which yeah. is i'm really excited about um and then of course frank has literally years and years of experience photographing the aurora you want to do a time lapse you want to do a time lapse with the slider i mean all of these things if you're at that level we can do but you know most of us come and we're just happy to get a couple of nice pictures yeah yeah, yeah. 
So that's that's available. I think there's five or six spots left in that last trip. Of course, the other two have sold out and, and it's just going to be a fantastic trip. Um, and I think I don't actually know when he's scheduling this third one. So I shouldn't say if it's before or after it might overlap a little bit with uh, the meteor shower. So you might even get a few meteors Ooh, in your room. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I didn't look at the dates of the third one, but I haven't uh, either. Early December 2019, and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and David will do. Uh, he does payments for those who know. You know, if if you don't have all the cash right now, just send him an email. He's he'll work with you, and there's no interest on that. It's it's actually a really great deal. That's how I went to Iceland back in 2015. My wife and I made payments to him, and it was yeah. it helped us to go. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we mentioned Photo Enthusiast Network. I mentioned a bunch of benefits. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it because somebody will comment, well, this is just a commercial. Um, but I'm really proud of what we've offered over the last year, and I'm excited about what we're offering in the years to come. Um, and uh, you just posted a video recently, Steve, of uh, creating a, a mirrored image. Yours is dramatic, so we should call it creating a dramatic mirrored image. <laughs> talk, talk about that for a second. Yeah, I think the title of the tutorial was a dramatic mirrored image because it because it is dramatic. And and one of the things that I say at the beginning of the tutorial, for those who haven't seen it, is I say to use this sparingly. I think a lot of these tricks, you know, these um, this th this was the same image duplicated and flipped around and, and mashed together. Um, but, you know, composites and stuff like that, like there's a really cool place for all that stuff. But it's it's unless you want that to just be your signature the way you do things um I, I just say you know use this sparingly make it dramatic i think uh the less you use a technique like i teach you here uh, the more dramatic it can be so yeah it's a photograph that i'm extremely proud of and you know i was sitting there trying to think about what do we want to roll out for a tutorial we've covered a lot of ground over the last year but there's going to be you know tons of stuff that we can uh, still work with people on and this one just was right at the top of mind, top of heart, and I wanted to show people how I made it. So hopefully you find some interest in that. Um, there's, I also give a disclosure that there's a number of ways that you can do this, and I'm not saying that my way was the most efficient way, uh, but it was the way that I kind of, the way that I ended up making the photograph. And uh, yeah, it was a shot that I was pretty proud of. Nice. It's a beautiful shot. I'm just, I don't know if you can see, I'm showing it right now. Uh, really, really nice. Uh, it was on my screen, I think. Uh, and Chris was looking over my shoulder and she went, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was funny when I first posted that. Uh, so it was a, it was a Christmas gift for my father. I gave it to him on a large metal, uh, format and I wanted to talk to him about it and gift it to him. And, you know, have all that rolled out before anybody saw the picture. And I got his okay to share it. In fact, <laughs> my proud dad, he's hilarious. He's like, well, before I hang it on my wall, I'm going to put it in the back of my car, drive down to a couple of the local spots where I like to eat and have drinks and stuff. And uh, we all know the owners. When I come into town, we kind of do this circuit and we see all my old buddies who are now restaurant owners and stuff in town. And, uh, and he said, I want to show it to all them and maybe lend it to them from time to time to hang on and the restaurant. Uh, so we'll see where that one goes. But anyway, yeah, that's, it was, it was that's funny. That's really cute. Proud dad toting around the picture. <laughs> yeah. That's that's my pops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple other quick catch up things, uh, stuff that's gone out on my channel, the Sony 24 millimeter F 1.4 review. I talked briefly about that on this show. Uh, it's just a fantastic lens. And not only is it really sharp, but I love how portable and lightweight it is. Steve, I remember putting it in your hand um, on the Alaska trip. And although we didn't get to use it to shoot the Aurora uh, too much, uh, you were impressed with its lightweight too? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That thing is awesome. Yeah. So I really hope to see more kind of smart lenses like that from Sony. I know not everybody buys into the mirrorless system to go lighter and kind of more compact, but I, I, I did. And so anytime Sony can match a lens like that or third party like Tamron's 28 to 75, I'm pretty happy with that. So that was a quick video that went out. Also, my favorite time of the year for many reasons. One of them is getting to release the slideshow of your favorite photo. I like it for two reasons. One, I love to see all of your work together in a little slideshow set to some music. Uh, and two, I love giving you the challenge of picking just one photo out of all of the photos you captured in the last year um, as the moment. 
Um, mine's in there too. If you watch carefully, it's just stuck in there like a minute or two in, I think. Um, it was yeah, funny. Was the, uh, the drone shot of the yeah. iceberg. Yep. Right. Yeah. Now I, I'm spoiling that a little bit um, and it's okay. It's not like it's a secret, uh, but I am going to release a 2018 year in review video uh, that kind of covers my travels over this last year. Uh, some behind the scenes stuff that you didn't see. Some of the trips I didn't really talk about, you know, publicly that just, you know, here and there, um, and count down my favorite images of the year. Uh, and uh, spoiler, it is that one for several reasons, but I'll talk about it in the full video. Yeah, that that was awesome. I love when you do that. I, ever since I've known you, you've been putting these end of the year videos together, and um, they've gotten uh, they've gotten bigger and bigger. You know, as your audience has grown. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, the quality of so many of the pictures that came in. And granted, you're only looking at it for a few seconds, but I, I was watching it and never once did I take my eye off the screen. I mean, I was totally engaged in each person's photo that popped up and there was some really outstanding pictures. In there there. were was, was some beautiful pictures in there. I loved seeing our photo enthusiast members participating. I love seeing people that I've yeah. known for years participating um, and uh, you know, a good number of uh, new folks as well. Um, yeah. I only had to everybody, almost everybody followed the rules. Every year I have to like, there's a handful that come in are like literally this big and I have to say, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, click those in the slideshow, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, almost everybody followed the rules and almost everybody, it seemed like that was really actually their favorite picture of the year. Um, and there was one person that submitted a collage of a Barbie doll, like multiple pictures and angles with hot pink border. If you're watching, I'm sorry, a collage <laughs> with a hot pink. If it had been, seriously, if it had been just one picture of that Barbie doll, if that had been your favorite picture, the way you made it, okay, I would have taken it, but yeah. not a collage that's hot pink, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I had to I had to exclude that one. So. Well, that's too bad because now I want to see that collage. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a reminder, I see a couple of questions, good questions being posted in the chat room. Uh, if you put a cue in front of those, Roy is collecting them. We'll answer them at the end. I also I should apologize up front. Steve and I like to talk, but we do both have hard outs today. We got to end the show and right around three o'clock. Um, I got to deliver. Uh, I got to deliver my children to the zoo. Literally, oh. that, that sounds really appropriate. <laughs> no, I mean that. You gotta, you gotta give them back to the zoo, huh? You gotta give them back to the zoo. My for the day, it's time to go back. <laughs> yeah, if you watch my Instagram story, my 12 year old was taking up my computer playing Fortnite. He is obsessed. Um, it is fun. I enjoy it because when we play against each other, I can still crush him um, enough that he gets pretty upset, which is, you know, every dad's <laughs> dream. Make your 12 year old cry because you killed him over and over again. Jeez, father of the year goes to Toby Gelston. Let's jump in. Is that father of year 2018 or 2019? I got I got a lot of time to make it up. If it's uh, you kind of, yeah, you kind of merged it right into uh, 2019. So way to start the year off right. Yeah, yeah. If you're tuned in and you're waiting for me to talk a little bit about the gear on the desk, we'll get to that really soon. But part of the show that we love is uh, taking your images into our Lightroom, into Lightroom. It's not really ours um, and giving you some tips and tricks for uh, improving their quality. If you want to participate in this in the future, you should become a photo enthusiast network member. You find out more about that at photorectv.pen dash slash pen. All right. Yeah, so, I, um, I'm, uh, I know that you're going to talk about what's on there. I'm very curious as to why there's two Nikon mirrorless full frame mirrorless cameras mm, sitting on the desk. I'm I guessing know. Z7 and Z6, but uh, and whatever that orange thing is. So anyway, let's move forward. Yeah, that orange thing. So here's here's the behind the scenes. Okay, here we are. We'll talk about that orange thing in just a minute. But so right now I'm giving it two thumbs up. All right. First up, we got Pam sending us a Nikon Z6 lens ball picture. So Pam, I know you took delivery of the Z6 not too long ago and you've been quite happy with it. Um, you wanted to know a little bit more about how to get rid of, I think this lens ball is sitting on one of its little holders. Steve, you could have used that in the Arctic for those who don't know. <laughs> That's a hand saver right there. I practically burned my left hand off in the Arctic. We go above and beyond. One of our clients, Kate, brought along a lens ball. Steve was holding it in his hand, and uh, yeah, you got a little toasty. Yeah, I had uh, I had two two layer. I had this huge fleece layer from my jacket that was wrapped around my the palm of my hand, plus my liner gloves, and I was holding this thing, and all of a sudden it started smoking, and my hand was burning, and it had burned through all the layers right onto my skin. Lovely. 
dangerous. I know. People, when you think of it about the Arctic, this is everybody I tell, I'm going to Antarctica. You, they're like, you're going to be so cold. I mean, it's not balmy down there, but we're talking their summertime. I don't think we'll see temperatures below 25 Fahrenheit. Is that fair, Steve? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Uh, it's it's actually very comfortable with yeah. the jacket you get, and, you know, a couple layers. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I know Pam wanted to um, get rid of the holder and the kind of the tripod head it's stuck up on uh, or it's sitting on. Mm -hmm. um, first off, Pam, you sent us JPEG. Um, I, this is good progress. You've sent us a nice large image. I know we've had a little problems with that in the past of getting very small images that are hard for us to work with. Now I want to give you the task, Pam, of sending us a DNG or raw image that we can really edit some. Because um, the first thing, I, I like the the darker image, but it's a little too dark for my taste. And we're, with the, with this JPEG, we're a little bit more limited in what we can do with it. If I bring the exposure up a bit, um, yeah. See, I like that. I like the uh, the brightness that you get behind it. It creates the the um, uh, silhouette of mm -hmm. the lens ball on its holder. Mm -hmm. The only part that bothers me about the stand that it's on, I, I actually, I don't mind it at all. I think if it was just floating in midair, it would look really odd, especially because the tree is intersecting, you mm -hmm. know, intersecting it. So it's not like it's just floating without some kind of, uh, with no anchor, you know, it's, it would, if you take that part away, then you're going to totally notice the tree will look like it's holding it in the upper right hand side. Yeah. So I like what you did right there, because yeah. the only thing that was bothering me about the stand was below the horizontal plate. Yep. And so I would challenge you, Pam, to just leave it in there like that. I, mm -hmm. I think that looks really cool and definitely, you know, kind of brightening it up still leaves the lens ball as a silhouette. Mm -hmm. Um, there's yeah. a lot of banding that I'm seeing, but that could just be the resolution and then my screen on this recording and stuff. Yeah, I'm actually getting that here too. I believe that's the JPEG. I mean, I, I updated, I, or I, sorry, I moved the exposure up to full stops. So, um, you know, uh, I just the JPEG just starts to fall apart when you do it that much. But uh, Pam, who comments in chat that she's working on the raw right now, um, you should be able to do this and not see that level of banding um, that we're, we're getting here. This kind of grad gradation of it's almost rainbow like. And then, yeah. 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 I, and, you know, I'm, I brought the blacks down a little bit to kind of accentuate and take any of the noise and uh, out of here and just kind of really darken the dark parts to make sure they're, they're a pure black. Um, you know, we don't typically want that, but I think it works well in here. And in a future shot, I'd challenge you, Pam, to think about this intersection here. And if you'd come up just a little bit, it looks like there's not that much overlap of the branches. And, and maybe have it kind of more framed by this and a little bit less uh, touching. Yeah, I might even... Uh, see, here's the thing with, with lens ball photography. I, I'm really a novice with this. I don't own one. I played around with them when clients have had it. But I don't, I don't really know, like what's a good lens ball shot mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in the world of photography. It's kind of a trend. It's kind of a fad that's come up in the last couple of years. And, and there's some cool elements to it. I, I think if I was taking this shot again, I'd, I'd move over to the right a little bit. So you get some separation from the tree and the, and the uh, shape of the lens ball. I may even consider putting the sun directly behind it and just shooting the reflection of that sunset in there without the actual sunset behind it might be a cool shot too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I like what you've done here, Pam. I think it's really cool, but just some things to think about as you, as you take your new camera out and you play around with this, uh, just look for, you know, where, where lines intersect. And, um, and I do, you know, I, I like what you've done here, Toby, with just a simple crop and lightening up a little bit. It didn't take much. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree, and I I like that suggestion of hiding this possibly behind the lens ball because my eye keeps getting drawn over to it. It's just so bright. Yeah, it creates two um, two subject matters that are you know vying for your visual attention, and when you're when you're doing that tennis match view, it just kind of becomes stressful to the eye. Like, okay, where am I supposed to look? Um, so it's not bad. It's yeah, just, yeah. you know, some things to think about to be very unapologetic and keeping it simple on what your subject is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Kate mentioned she's got one of these lens balls as well. I got sent one uh, from that company a little while ago and I took it out and I made a couple of neat shots with it, but I too kind of struggle to figure out what to really do with it. Um, but it, it can be one of those things where if you're in a little bit of a rut, um, you know, helps you see the world a little bit differently and certainly fun as long as you're not burning yourself with it. <laughs> yes. All right. Tim went to uh, New York a little weekend with his lady and uh, looks like he got to sneak in a little bit of photography too. Nice yeah. shot of Grand Central Station. He calls it a pano. Let's see. Yeah, we got a 10,000 by 6,000 image. So I'm going to suspect this might be a two or three shot vertical image. Um, two or three shot vertical. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, all right. Uh, vertical orientation, but or, moving yeah, left okay. and right. Gotcha. I think, you know, if we, if we hit the R key, I think, yeah, we got basically where each of the grid lines is. I imagine we have a shot. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing, Tim, that I would say on a photograph like this is, um, Toby, go back to the crop, the open crop where it shows the edges. I would actually, um, so if it was me, I would look at the very top there where those arches meet the top of the frame. I mm -hmm. definitely wouldn't. I would leave some space and even if you have to create go take it into photoshop and create uh some extra green up there in the top left to fill that in but that gives you a little bit of breathing room at the top and mm -hmm. uh, you can work with the symmetry but i think before you even get there what you really need to do is go down to the transform tool in lightroom and i would probably do the guided uh transform and i would draw two vertical lines um on each of those giant square pillars on the right and the left that have wreaths on them he's actually done that i don't know if that's coming through for oh, you he did. But, uh, yep i hit the upright we've got one here on the left column okay and we've got a short one over here on the right column i don't think it matters the length as long as you bring it down a little it might tweak it a little and then he's got a straight one across the back okay all right um i would i would probably pick an interior line on those columns on the right and left yeah, okay. uh, rather than the exterior because it's the the interior that really is it leaning yeah so let me show people real quick if you say hey this is not the guided line i want to use you just hover your mouse over it press the delete key and it just kind of vanishes i don't think there's any others um there's uh there's a limit of four so. yeah yeah all right so let's pick uh this outside line right here yeah, that, right down that corner and this actually let's do the same one on the other side right here and then where would you pick uh maybe across the balcony i think where he had it was yeah was good okay uh, or, or yep. maybe okay. even those yeah those those windows there so it's still leaning back a little bit now you can take those vertical lines and just kind of click on the bottom of one and and just move it side to side, almost like a pendulum. And um, it's it's Oops. counter, it's it's opposite of what you'd think. So if you want it to lean a little bit more, uh -huh. yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I've actually I've never tweaked a line. Look at that. Yeah. It's just you know just a very slight can make mm -hmm. a, a pretty good difference and yeah. just prevents it from laying down quite so much. I'm not sure if that was a huge improvement, but. Yeah, I definitely like this. And, you know, this is uh, one of those, let's, you know, I, I mentioned this, but let's let's uh, pop it into Photoshop real quick and see. Um, no, I don't want to help uh, you right now, Photoshop. Uh, let's see if we can just show how easy it is to create that up there. I think we've done it before, but folks, if you're watching for the first time, um, this is what I would recommend. And you can see, uh, going back to that shot, you don't have to show it, Toby, but I just want to say this. When you're shooting something like that and you want it to be symmetrical, now that was a pano, so you're stitching things together. It gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but trying to be dead center, but more importantly, well, I mean, being dead center is, is extremely important, but having your camera as level as possible. Mm -hmm. um, because any, any tilt, especially when you're shooting wide, when it comes to architecture and trying to make a, a symmetrical image is, uh, is really um, tricky. Yeah, and that is where shooting a pano adds a layer of complexity to it. Yeah. And we talk about this a lot on our tours. Uh, you know, people talk about getting a, 
a head specifically, a tripod head specifically for shooting panos and finding the nodal point. And typically I poo-poo that. I say, you know, just kind of line it up, overlap by about a third. But when you are shooting architecture and a pano, uh, the, the uh, being as careful as possible really will help a lot. So I've just uh, gone in here, I selected this, I went to edit content aware fill, and this is this new update to Photoshop. It's, it allows you to kind of say, hey, pick from this area, but not this area. And so um, I'm finding it to be a little bit better. And uh, yeah. there it seems okay. And then we got a tiny little bit right there, just real quick edit content aware fill. And oops, I ended up on the layer above. It, that's another new feature, right? It adds new layers instead. And yes, just say okay. And uh, not bad. Now, if you were printing this, you would want to zoom in up there and you might want to try to recreate those lines. But honestly, it doesn't look that different from some of the yeah, other spots where the lines look looked a little rubbed off. And let's go look at this corner real quick. Not bad. Yeah. You, you might get some historian that knows this ceiling really well and say, well, that star doesn't exist there, but they'd have to be a, they'd have to be a real Union Station nerd, Grand Central Station. Yeah, and this is also a, a shot where it, you have to say it again, like uh, you got to leave a lot of space. If, if you know you're going to have to transform the yeah. image and the yeah. angles, um, you've got to leave a ton of, of cropping space. Because it's going to be a huge file when you stitch it all together. So you'll have plenty to work with. But the more space you have to just select exactly where the the right point is, the better. It's hard, you know, because then, and then you got that American flag over on the left-hand side, which is just totally dominating my visual attention anyway. Yeah. Uh, and it stops me from kind of moving over left to right through the image. But um, it's cool. Yeah. And, it, and it's a great uh, learning tool to talk about. Some and I love, I want to just uh, shout out five seconds shutter speed here, I think was really nice. We have this feeling yeah. of motion uh, from a lot of people, but not everybody. I like that mix. Um, and I think it's just, uh, it was just a nice blend. Uh, any shorter and we just have these kind of people that were just slightly blurry any longer and there'd be too much mush. So I think you did a nice job with five seconds, Tim. Yeah, that is cool. Um, well uh, Tim, we're going to skip your other New York shot for right now. Um, it, we'll come back to it uh, next show um, just because of time constraints. But here we've got uh, Kate who has shot these hippos. She gave us the original straight out of camera. Um, looks like you may have spent a little time at the zoo because I don't think you're underwater with them. And we also see the reflections. And I know, Kate, you've asked how to help reduce the amount of reflections you've got. And then you've sent along your edited version, the D&G. And I think going black and white with this was fantastic. Um, and I think you've done a really nice job. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, when you show the original, you can tell that she's shooting through glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way to minimize that, really, uh, Toby, you can add to this. Um, it's it's hard to do, first of all, but the, as much as you can press the lens right up onto the glass, maybe yeah. re remove the, uh, the lens hood if you have one on, yeah. get that lens right on the glass to take the shot. I know that limits your angles and stuff, but getting that reflection out of there is is kind of what you're after. Uh, but she did a nice job of taking those out and going, going black and white looks really cool. It All of a sudden you have the feeling that she's down in the water with them when you take those reflections out. Yeah, yeah. And we even got, you know, I, I think I really like the positioning here. Um, I, just you've done a nice job. Another way to reduce reflections is a circular polarizer filter. It can just cut reflections completely, but it also can be tricky in a situation like this because it cuts at least, I don't want to say a full stop of light, but, but close to it at times, depending on what brand you have. Um, and you're already at ISO 800, so that push you up at ISO 1600. That's you know not a huge difference, but it certainly is. Um, but it will really cut reflections. You can, um, the other thing I do is uh, come in here. We could just do it in Lightroom. You know, just these streaks, those are reflection streaks. So we get rid of those pretty quickly, be a little bit more careful across the hippo, but you know, they just kind of absorb that uh, pretty easily. So that's just the cue and I'm just healing. Lightroom's um, gotten a lot better at uh, doing this healing than it, it was has. 12 months ago. It has. Notice though, notice I just accidentally, you know, kind of sloppily 
uh, sampled from up here and it duplicated that. You really watch for that repetition when you duplicate. You want to make sure it looks pretty natural. Somewhere around there should be pretty good. And then my other trick that I've, I've shared before, but I'll share again here. I love the radio filter. Um, it's set on something weird. No, I don't want to make them green. I'm just going to reset it. I'm going to not invert it. Uh, and I'm going to just drop the sharpness and uh, clarity a bit and noise removal up. And so outside of them becomes a bit softer. Now I'm overdoing it, kind of exaggerating uh, the effect a bit, but um, it really will kind of hide some of that reflections and or some of the scratches in the glass around them. And we focus in on them a little bit more. Yeah, and you may want to add a bit of a black vignette back into the uh, into the image. I know we do a lot of work to remove vignetting, but this one, it's dead center. You know, it'll really kind of make them pop off of the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nicely done, Kate. Uh, and then let's take a look at Kevin's waterfall or, you know, a little, I think this is a little Pennsylvania stream. That's what I'm going to guess it is. Uh, uh, my first thought on this is there's not a lot of exciting color in it. Yeah, there's there's just, and there's a lot going on. You've got leaves moving at the bottom of the frame. You've got rocks that are kind of a visual stopper with some sheen on them that the water's going around, uh, you know, half or midway up the frame on the left-hand side. You have an extremely bright spot on the top left side, which mm -hmm. competes with the white water. Mm -hmm. I would consider coming in tighter, maybe a 16 by 9 sort of format. I'd try to get that bright spot out of there uh, and just isolate this. You know, like Toby, you showed um, on one of your videos recently a great waterfall picture. And I saw it and you, you said like, you know, you come in really tight on this and you can't tell exactly how big or how small this waterfall is. And I thought it was giant. And then you showed me the waterfall that you were shooting and it was just tiny. It was somewhere right by where you live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I just hit the black and white button. Uh, sometimes it's interesting though, to see the difference if you bring saturation and vibrance down, uh, it can give you slightly different results. As soon as I uh, make it black and white with either method, I almost always bring the contrast up to kind of emphasize that difference between the black and the white. Uh, you know, you're making, think about it. We often talk about we're making a black and white. We're not making a grayscale. I mean, yes, it is. There's, you have the full tone. You can see that Instagram, but we really kind of want to, I think, often emphasize the extremes in a black and white. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and bringing, bringing the whites down just a bit or the highlights down a bit are going to give a little bit more detail in those, mm -hmm. those highlighted areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, now there's a moodiness to it and you almost, I don't think you have the room to do it without totally, you know, making the photo so small that the quality is going to suffer, but you want to, a, a, a waterfall like this, you want to just zoom in really tight on one little aspect of it. Yeah. Even if you can't get in tight, use like a 70 to 200 lens or something and get in really tight on it and, yeah. and show the movement around a still rock or you know, just something in there. I think, I think almost, the almost make it an abstract image. Yeah, 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 exactly. It almost gives somebody the impression, okay, I, I get what's going on here, but I have to look at it for a little bit just to, to understand what I'm looking at. And uh, the original image, there was, there was just a lot, a lot going on, a lot in one, one image. I couldn't get an understanding of what the subject was. One other thing that I'll often do, you know, a circular polarizer, I don't think was used here, Kevin, because there's a little bit of a shine to the rock and a circular polarizer will also take that away. But I often will up the clarity on the rocks in if there's multiple rocks to really emphasize uh, that contrast as well between the kind of hard, sharp rocks and the smooth, pillowy water, as Steve likes to say. <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. I usually lighten those areas and increase the clarity. Um, to draw more attention to them and show that contrast, like you said. Yep, yep. Uh, chat room's having a discussion. Uh, another option that is excellent, we should mention for cutting reflections is the collapsible lens hoods. Uh, there is a actual product called Lens Skirt. They're a little bit, 
you know, fancy uh, in that they actually have suction cups to the window and then the, the, the lenses. And I don't think many zoos or aquariums, uh, you know, on a busy day would would allow you to use those or allow you to use them for more than a few seconds before they said, hey. But there are rubbery lens hoods as well that you could look at um, and see if one of those would work. If you're, if you're you know, shooting inside often, uh, cutting need to cut reflections, then um, that's something to uh, think about. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're in a car going down the road and something cool is outside, for heaven's sake, folks, if you can do it, please roll down the window and shoot. Yeah, <laughs> good point. I, I mean, I say that because we're leading tours all the time and uh, some of them we're driving a lot. And yeah. you just, I'll look in my rear view mirror and I, I hear this click, 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 which is great. You're passing by all this cool stuff and we can't stop at all of it. But all of a sudden I'm like, you got to roll the window down. You just get nothing but glare. You can't stop, but no, never mind. You're right. Yep. All right, let's move on. Uh, and uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Tech Barf. That's some, you know, techie focused news stories. And this is also a great time to talk about some of the tech on the table. Um, Canon and Icon released the worst cameras of 2018. This is an <laughs> article for from F-Stoppers, which, you know, all right, everybody likes to be a little clickbaity, uh, yeah, or, yeah. or I don't know if they like to. They recognize that it often brings in, um, you know, more eyeballs. Uh, and this, and this, the article proposes that uh, these cameras, the Nikon and the Nikon mirrorless Z6, Z7 that I have here, and the EOS R, are pretty big letdowns. Um, that's. I, you know, I agree to an extent with that. I think they are letdowns to a degree, especially when you look at how much Nikon hyped the Z series, super revolutionary, going to completely redesign. But also what you have to think about it or separate here is just because we're saying they're the worst cameras or that they're a letdown doesn't mean that they're a bad camera. Um, yeah. I, I really like both of the Zs here. Um, the sensors are fantastic, which is important to me. Uh, I've been really having a good time shooting with them, no frustrations in using them. And I'm not typically a Nikon photographer or videographer. And so for these to be in my hand and feel so comfortable so quickly, I really like them. I, that said, I don't think the Z7 is a good value. I think it's overpriced. Nikon, you, you price that very high. Uh, the Z6, though, I think is a very nice value and a good all-around camera. I've been working hard to try to nail down that autofocus and, and be able to talk knowledgeably about it. And it's still not great. Uh, it's continuous autofocus is not as consistent as I would like to see at this price point. Or when you say, hey, look at the Fuji X-T3 or look at the Sony a7 III that are right about at the same price point. Um, that that camera, it just, I'd feel comfortable going and shooting a safari where you might have fast action or going to you know a birthday party full of toddlers and having kids running around the room knowing I'm gonna get shots with the Sony, whereas I don't, I don't feel I can say the same with the, the uh, Nikon. I know Caleb is going to follow up and say, well, you know, what is it comparable to? You know, I, I think it's not even as good as the Nikon D750, which is, you know, Nikon did pretty well with tracking in that camera. Uh, I also said the same thing about the EOS R. And there's been people that have commented on my video and said that they have shot basketball games and been very happy with the autofocus system of the EOS R. So, you know, this is just my opinion. Um, it's certainly not bad, but it's just not as consistently good as I would like. I had my kids walk towards me multiple times. I had Kaz walk towards me multiple times and trying all of the different focusing options. And sometimes it was decent and sometimes it was terrible. And with the Sony, it's far more consistently good when I compare them as making everything as equal as possible. Yeah, I think you nailed it when you said, you know, a lot of it was just the marketing hype. This was touted to be the next greatest camera in the world or whatever. And then it, it rolls out and it's kind of lackluster in comparison to a statement like that. Uh, and that happens a lot. Um, and, you know, we, we get our hopes up. We do it with all these major companies that are innovative. We do it with Apple. We do it with Canon and Nikon. And, and Sony, you know, tends to blow us away. And DJI is one of those, too, that's surprising us. But remember, it wasn't too long ago that Apple was constantly doing that. And everybody's criticizing Apple's innovation or, 
lack thereof. But I think uh, I think comparing the Nikon and the EOS R from Canon, Nikon did a great job. If you're in the Nikon world and you want a full frame mirrorless camera, and you've got you've been saving up for it, I think you've got a really a couple really nice options here. And somebody like Pam's case. <laughs> No pun intended, Pam. Um, going to the Z6, you know, she's wanted to upgrade her camera for a while. She's an icon shooter. That was a that was a great buy. I mean, that there's no way that I could consider talking her out of doing that. I think it was a, a great way to go. Um, if if I'm a Canon guy and I'm saving up and waiting for a mirrorless, yeah, I'm pretty disappointed with what they came out with. I don't know that I'd make that leap. If I was Nikon, I, I probably would. Uh, anyway, now, if you're just new and you're looking at all the brands, you're looking at Sony and Olympus and uh, Panasonic and everything that's that's out there, Fuji, um, yeah, it makes it, it makes it pretty difficult. But that's – I didn't read the article about the worst cameras of 2018. It, it just makes me laugh because it seems like clickbait to me. I'm yeah. like, God. People can just be, who's that? I almost don't even want to give them any airtime, but there's that YouTuber that I've told you about that I can't stand. And I'll just go ahead and say it, even if you send the show out publicly. The uh, the pissed off photographer guy, I forgot yeah. his Yep, yeah, not a fit, big fan. <laughs> you read an, a headline like that, I'll just look <laughs> the other way. I probably won't even read the article because yeah. it's just somebody complaining about something that yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. To give well, balance, go, sorry, Steve. No, I was just saying that's me. Yeah, yeah. this is a lot of my personal opinion coming out. Um, to, to give, uh, God, the image quality is just fantastic. Really happy with the image quality. And single autofocus, uh, you know, again and again, both of these cameras, I have no complaints. It's when you just start to track kind of a moving subject that um, I, I feel like they're a little lackluster. One of the things, though, that I really kind of enjoy using on the Nikons and makes me extra frustrated on the Sony is the lag on Sony. Menus, playback, the Sony is always kind of like, yeah, okay, I'll show that picture to you. Give me a second. Uh, I'm almost there. And I've learned to live with it. But when I get this camera in my hand that has the same megapixels and I shoot, shoot, shoot. And part of that is they went with the XQD uh, cards. So that's faster. But you hit playback. And even if you've shot a burst, it shows you a relatively recent picture and then boom, 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 they load like that. Whereas the Sony, you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And also, I think the control system is is nicer on this um, Nikon and you've got that full touch screen that works really well. Sony's touch screen, ugh. I, I love my Sony, you know, overall. I think, I still think it is the best camera for me, but... Um, these are quite nice and uh, they've done a great job. 2019 is gonna be really exciting. I think so, uh, Nikon can fix some of these issues with firmware updates. Some of this kind of autofocus, we've seen Panasonic do it. I think Nikon can do it as well. Um, I, 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 and I think Nikon as a company would be more likely. On the Canon side of things, EOS R folks, if you're hoping for firmware updates that improve that autofocus and kind of continuous, I think that's a little bit less likely. But again, man, all of these cameras, they're, they're producing really good images. Um, you just want to make sure they're suited for the type of photography and videography that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And and I think Canon's going to be a real slow burn. In fact, I was reading an article on Canon Rumors uh, yesterday or today, and it was talking about the amount of lenses, RF lenses, that might be coming out in the next year. And mm -hmm. man, there's a lot. So, yeah. you know, they'll keep investing in better camera bodies. Um, I think we need to learn to just kind of tamper down our expectations to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. and kind of a bummer to say that when we're uh, looking at tech gear and it moves so quickly and advances so quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But like you said, you know, cameras just in the last few years have just come such a long way. The dynamic range and what we're getting from these sensors is unbelievable. I mean, our, we're having to buy storage just to keep up with this stuff. Uh, other, I wanted to mention this real quick because, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of looking for, I, I like my DGI products. We just mentioned uh, the Pocket Osmo, um, which Kaz has that right now. Uh, he used it to film uh, my thoughts on the Z6, which will be out for you all very soon. So you'll get, I know I just kind of piecemealed a little bit of stuff for you, but you're going to get a, um, a much more thoughtful uh, video about the Z6 very soon. 
Um, and he used a little pocket Osmo and he was mostly impressed with it, but he said the race to be so small has made that, uh, you know, it has made some limitations with it. And he might think that many of us would be better off buying those $99 cell phone stabilizers and throwing your own cell phone in it um, than spending so much on 350 on this little gizmo. Uh, but I'll have some more thoughts on that as well soon. Um, I've been testing this Evo Autel drone. It's it looks a lot like the Mavic, um, but it does a couple of things differently. One is it's got 4K 60p. Why do I like that? Because you slow that down half speed and you can get some really cool shots of waves or, you know, people walking um, and very easy to fly. Very similar to the Mavic in a lot of ways. Its controller is cool and this is what I love. It's got this pretty big screen here that gives you all of your information readout and you hit the display button. It gives you the video readout. You don't have to put your cell phone in here. That is huge. And this drone is ready to go so fast without having to plug your uh, phone in or you can even plug it in after you start flying and to do the kind of more automated stuff. I'm really impressed with that. I Who also hear... This? Autel, A-U-T-E-L. I also hear really good things about their tech support, which is an area where DJI has, has certainly suffered. I see a lot of angry people online. I haven't had any problems with DJI tech support. I, I haven't had to use it yet. Um, so we'll see. But I am um, almost definitely taking the Mavic 2 to Antarctica with me, um, which I'm excited about. As, as impressed as I am with this, I want that larger sensor, and I also want to fly something that I know I'm very comfortable with the Mavics, but um, I'll say more about this soon. Um, but I think it's a very good value, especially if you don't love the idea of a DJI monopoly in the drone space. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that's it for gear on table. And, you know, before we run out of time, I wanted to hit a couple other things to talk about. Uh, and one is counterfeit goods on Amazon. You know, people email me. Probably, I get a couple emails a day that says, you know, either through people that are coming on tours or people that have seen a video of mine and want a personal recommendation. And then when they know that, that you know, a way to kind of thank me for my time is to buy through the affiliate links and I give them Amazon links or B&H, more and more I'm saying, you know, just go to B&H. Not because it gives me more, but because you, the, the, potential of counterfeit there is so much less. Amazon has let these third parties in and when you go search something like the EOS R or the Altel Evo or a DJI drone, you get all of these third parties selling this stuff with a bunch of crap. And sometimes you're not even sure if the actual product that you want is the original, especially with batteries and memory cards. And yeah. so... Just be careful, folks. Um, I, I would shop B&H more and more for those big, important things because that's what you're getting is what you see. And we don't hear the stories. You hear the stories every once in a while of people opening up a box thinking they had an iMac in there and it's a bunch of bricks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of frustrating because there's so many sellers now on Amazon and you have to look at some of the fine print that's like fulfilled by Amazon, which that's nothing new. But um, I've I've had some issues with Amazon, not necessarily counterfeit camera gear or anything. But um, you know, I, I, the first thing I do when I'm filtering through stuff on Amazon is I click Prime, and I know that this can happen even under Prime. But I want to know that it's going to be shipped quickly, and if there's a problem, it's it's free shipping and free returns. I also look for that when I'm when I'm purchasing um, because it is, it's kind of become this like eBay ish marketplace at times. And that, that just turns me off so much. So it does drive me to places like B and H or Adorama, but especially B and H. Mm -hmm. And um, I just had a huge, I won't get into it here, but I had a big customer service issue with my echo show, which is mm -hmm. an Amazon product. Like they yeah. make that product. And, uh, Long story short, I've sent back my second one now and gotten a refund and I'm picking up the second generation, which of course was back ordered. So I'm not going to get it for a while, but <laughs> it took me, I've been dealing with this for a year, you know, Oh, that is frustrating. If you add up the amount of hours that I've spent on the phone with them, uh, it's just, it's just a time suck. I'm, you know, just kind of fed up with the way they handled it. I was really disappointed. I almost called my buddy Tim and said, 
dude, can you can you tell somebody in customer service to figure this thing out? This is absurd. Yeah. But, uh, no. I still love Amazon. Still got a lot of love for them, but it's getting a little messy in there. That's a, that's a great way to say it. I still love Amazon, but it's definitely getting a little messy in there. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to neat stuff. And just a reminder, photorec.tv slash MMH is where you can find the links to all of these articles that we're mentioning. And uh, if you want to see more about any of them, their sources, click on through. Uh, I This caught my eye. This was a little bit before Christmas, I think, that I saw this. Photographer shocked after his $1.88 stock image shows up on a ton, on a ton of Walmart goods. <sighs> Can, why... In 2019, is this still an issue? Well, I mean, here's the thing. I actually, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Steve. So, I mean, he put this image up on stock photography and it was bought by someone at Walmart and they had the rights to stick it on whatever they wanted after they bought it. They stuck it on a mugs, on some calendar, on some greeting cards, and he feels gypped. Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, well, that that's kind of what I, I mean. It, yeah. And it goes both ways, yeah. right? It's ridiculous that people don't get credit. Like these large companies will post something to an Instagram feed and they won't give credit. Mm -hmm. Happened to Corey Rowe. Jameson uh, Whiskey, mm -hmm. Irish Whiskey, posted one of his pictures and they didn't give him credit. I mean, come on. It's Jameson. It's like the mm -hmm. largest Irish whiskey maker out there. Um, but it also goes the other way, that... You put it out there, you sell it for pennies, yeah. and they now have the rights to it. They can do whatever they want. And yeah. that's just kind of, yeah, you're really excited to get it out there at all costs. But then when some large company comes around and uses it and plasters it all over the place, you think that you're owed more. That's not the way it works. I'm sorry. Yeah, it did. It did make me. I totally agree with you. I, um, you know, this guy, you put it on stock photography. You sold it for that amount. Uh, now, it's just the thing. You say, well, I could have gotten so much more. They would have never found you. They would have never come to you. They would have never taken your image. You know, they wouldn't have searched websites for like Snowy Bridge. They went to a stock photography site for a Snowy Bridge. So um, I have no sympathy for this photographer, uh, you know, really, other than to say, if it happened to me, I'd be like, I'd feel the same, but I, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. I'd be like, oh, man, maybe I could have sold that for millions. But no, probably not. Uh, it does make me think about the images I put up on Shutterstock. And maybe I should pull off some of the ones that I really like. And the owl and you know one or two others are really the only ones that make me man money anyway. Those ones that are some of my, I think, better and more beautiful pictures, they don't sell. So um, I would be bummed to see some pictures that are special to me. Uh, get plastered all over some Walmart greeting card, I think. So I, I might take, in 2019, I might take some images back down off of the stock photography site. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And that's valid to uh, to discuss or have people actually think about is, you know, we always encourage people to do your homework and think about these things very carefully before you put your images up there because once they're purchased, they're purchased and they can go anywhere. But the ones that really mean something to you, uh, you know, really take that into consideration too. Yeah. The intangibles, not just the money, but all of a sudden, you know, you've got this, let's say that you took this beautiful portrait of your daughter or your son or something like that. And you put it up there and, you know, people are just buying it for pennies and all of a sudden it's plastered on billboards and stuff. You see it all over the place. I mean, that's, that hits you right at home. Yep. Uh, those burrito fixings, man. You start plastering those all over the place, you're you're gonna get a little butt hurt over that. <laughs> butt hurt. Wow. Um, Can I say that on the show? No. <laughs> um, you, you know that. It's, I think you brought that one up because that I take that everywhere. Chipotle, <laughs> plaster that everywhere. I made that specifically for stock, and so I'd be really happy to see that be used more than the five times it's been bought for 29 or 89 cents from Adobe stock is actually where that's seen most of its sales. So, and for those watching the show who don't know, um, I've been calling an experiment. I've been putting images up at Shutterstock. I'm making about uh, somewhere between 15 and 30 bucks a month, mostly from a picture of an owl and uh, the Washington Monument at sunrise. That's, uh, you know, the, if I took out all of my rest of my images, uh, you know, it would impact uh, probably dropped me about 25% about per month of what I'm making. So really uh, not a significant amount. 
Can you think of any time in your life in the last few years that you've heard of anybody just really making a living with Shutterstock? Uh, those people who um, were stock photographers early before Shutterstock came along or those people who um, have devoted their entire life and career to it and somebody writes an article about them. Uh, that's few and far between. Mm -hmm. But there are the people that have, you know, have kind of like a home studio and access to have that experience. I don't know of anybody who's like, oh, I'm going to start making a living being a stock photographer. You know, most of these people come from commercial photographer backgrounds and have some experience and kind of build up a portfolio and then go into it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to deter people from it, but, you know, I, it seems to me anytime Shutterstock or any of these stock photography companies make the news or we talk about them or, it, you know, something comes across our ticker, it's, it's never really good news. <laughs> you never yeah. hear like. I bought my new house with the money that I've got from Shutterstock or, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, you hear more about YouTube success than you do stock photography success. That's there. a really interesting question. I wonder, I don't know how anybody could figure out that data, but I would, I would be interested. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, part of the reason I started this experiment um, was to prove to people because I get that question fairly often, you know, I want to sell my pictures. How can I sell my pictures and get rich? Um, and, the answer is not stock photography uh, unless you can pour your life into it. And even then, probably not. It's kind of like the middle schoolers who say, I want to be a pro sports player. You know? <laughs> mm, the number of you that's going to do that and buy a house being a pro sports player is very small. Yeah, yeah. We got to start wrapping this show up. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about copyright versus inspiration uh, or copying versus inspiration, but you wrote a fantastic Tuesday tip, which photo enthusiast me members know that is a weekly email that you get on a variety of subjects from what should your shutter speed be for different situations to how do you find inspiration in others work that I'm referencing that you wrote, Steve, um, a couple months ago now in 2018. Yeah. Um, it's been a few months, but if you just go into the membership area and Tuesday tips and scroll down, it's titled uh, need inspiration, steal it. Yeah. And that's, it, it kind of goes right into how I taught myself how to do a lot of editing um, just by uh, copying what other people had done, pull it up on my screen, put it next to my picture, move the sliders around until it looks like theirs, at least the, you know, colors and stuff. And then, you know, from there you create your own style, but yeah. I haven't read this article that you're referencing, but, uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating. I know we were talking offline before the show started about that. So maybe, maybe we punt that to next week or something. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it down the road a little bit. Um, and real quick, just Kyle, um, mentions that he has been in the business of buying stock images as part of his work over the last 17 years. Mm. When he started selling, he was shocked at how little the actual photographer got. And that's the other thing you use, you use Shutterstock. Um, the good is that's where people go to find work. The bad yeah. is um, because they have the, the quantity they can give you pass on to you a very small amount. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. And he would know, I mean, uh, Kyle is the guy that was doing all the printing for the millions of Walmart images that you see everywhere. <laughs> I mean, he was doing a lot of real big, big uh, canvas print or, I don't know if it was canvas, but anyway, um, yeah, that has been his, his line of work for many years. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, and also just Kyle. So I didn't hear this. Uh, there's some question if Walmart purchased the correct license for that image because they were producing more than 500,000 pieces. So yeah, that's, that's a whole, that's actually a discussion between, I believe between Shutterstock and Walmart, right. the yeah. photographer doesn't have anything part of that. And the photographer admitted that he didn't read the policies and you know regulations and you know i knew going into shutterstock what i was getting myself into but certainly situations like this make me stop and think a little bit about you know my pretty polar bear picture yeah i don't want to see that on a walmart greeting card nothing really against walmart but that does feel like it's kind of cheapens me 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we got to move on. So I want to just hit, we're going to skip photos from space today. Sorry. And we're going to dive right into just a couple of questions. Kevin is shooting a small wedding in October. He wants to rent a full frame Canon camera. Kevin's used to shooting Canon. So it makes sense to stay with Canon. He's trying to decide between the 5D Mark III and the four. I know in chat, Kate, Kate was uh, helping you, uh, Kevin, kind of make that decision. I'd say if you're renting, go for the four. That yeah. The improved autofocus, uh, the touchscreen makes the operation a little bit nicer. What else is a big difference? The image quality is noticeably better. Yeah, uh, megapixels. I mean, you you yeah. have a higher uh, higher image quality, but also it the the four does a much better job if you use servo at all. Now, I I rarely, I practically never use servo. But if it's a case where there's movement and stuff and people are changing depth of field on you and stuff, the servo in the 5D Mark IV is way better than the Mark III. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that um, comparing two trips to Tanzania. I had a Mark III on the first one and Mark IV on the other one. And it was much, much better with the Mark IV. I just consistently get much sharper images with my Mark IV than my Mark III. Uh, I still have my Mark III. I love it. It's a great camera. Yeah. But um, between the two, I bought the Mark IV thinking it would be a marginal bump, and it proved to be a much better camera than I thought it was going to be coming from the Mark III. So I'd say if you're renting, definitely go with the Mark IV. Now, if you're talking about October, I mean, that's quite a ways away. So there's probably not going to be much price difference between those two at that point. Both are uh, pretty long in the tooth. So I don't see rental yeah. companies charging too yeah. much for those, um, which you may also want to consider uh, price it out. But the 5DS series, if you don't need a lot of frames per second, uh, not the R, because the R, if you're shooting a wedding, is going to give you too much detail and skin tones and stuff like that. But the 5DS is beautiful. That's an amazing camera. But you got 50 megapixel files. You're not, you, your frames per second is a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the 5D Mark IV megapixels is, is kind of a sweet spot for wedding work. I wouldn't necessarily want to go much higher than that, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I would definitely rent a full frame cab for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to bash the Mark III. It's still a great camera, especially this, this many years later. But uh, just budget for it. You got a lot of time. Um, go with the four. Yeah. Dogs are telling me it's done upstairs, but we got uh, uh, another question from Kate. She's setting up a new computer. And basically, I think, Kate, you're asking, you want to add your raw files, do you, the ones you're still working on, to the new computer and then download Adobe uh, Lightroom and then add the raws into Lightroom or download your program, then your image files. Here's what I would do, Kate. I would, and I've got a video that talks about coming home from a trip and moving files over. I'd use that video, not coming home from a trip, but moving the files from your old computer to new computer. You wanna move the RAWs and the catalog over, and then I would install the program, or inst actually it doesn't matter, install the program on the new computer, move the catalog and the files over, and open that catalog in Lightroom, and you should be good to go. Yeah, yeah. So no need to export those as DNGs or something to retain the... No. the Changes no. just as long as you point it to the to the catalog, yep. you should be fine. Yeah, because exactly the catalog right. basically is the instruction manual for how the image should appear to you. So if you've done work to it and you're tied into that same catalog, nothing will change. Yeah. Um, but if that catalog changes, then it doesn't know how to show you the image. It just shows you the the raw, the original. And then Kate asked also, when uh, I demonstrated in the Lightroom tips and tricks section, when you're using content aware fill, should you merge down the layers when you are done? You know, that's a great question. I don't know if when you round trip back to Lightroom, if it compresses those layers automatically for you, because I know when you open it back up, they're gone. So I think I, it depends on how you save it back. If you uh, save it back as a TIFF or a JPEG or something, it's going to compress them down. If you yeah. save it as a PSD, it should reopen the way you had it. That's that's correct. Yep. And so if you know, if you're done, if you're happy with the way it went, you should certainly merge the layers um, because it's going to save you a little bit of space. Uh, those yeah. layers add significantly to the space pretty quickly. So yeah, you should merge Actually, them down. Actually, you know, when I do content aware fill, more often than not, I usually... I flatten the image before I get into that anyway. It just seems to do a 
cleaner job. And otherwise I, I forget what layer I'm on, but yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, no. And I mentioned resolution. So that was where our questions. Uh, thank you chat room for hanging out with us before we go though, Steve, do you have a, a new year photography goal or resolution? No, not necessarily. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same as last year and that was really to just slow things down, mm -hmm. but especially, uh, I was kind of laughing about this because I remember last year doing this show and you said, well, what kind of uh, big camera purchases do you have over the next 12 months as we get into this new year? And I'm like, I'm good. I don't need anything. I picked up a new iPad. My computer works well. My cameras are great. I'm fine. I don't need any camera gear. And then I invested in the Hasselblad media format <laughs> system halfway through the year. Yeah. Um, so having said that, though, that is a system that I'm just absolutely still in love with as much as the day that I you know, opened the box. And it's a system that really slows me down. So I want to shoot that a lot more this year. I want to slow down. I want to be intentional. I want to be very intentional about my composition and where things meet. I've, I've kind of been going there over the last few years anyway, but I think as we've been teaching more and more, that's, that's like a theme that I'm constantly reminding people about is before you press that shutter button, look around the frame. Where do things end? Where do they begin? How do they intersect? And I want to, you know, take some of my own advice on that this year. So just that. And then, uh, as you know, I'm in the process of redoing my website. We kind of chat about that each week, but I'm actually I did a lot of work on it today. So uh, that will be happening soon. That was a big one for me. Nice. I, I, I have basically the same goal. I've made mine a bit more uh, quantitative in that I shot about 50,000 images this year. And that does include some time lapses. I would like to end the year uh, 2019 with 25,000 images in my catalog. So uh, through a combination of being a little bit more mindful about what I'm shooting, um, a little more thoughtful, exactly as you just said, and being much more stringent about what I'm keeping around. Why do I have three copies of an image that looks virtually the same? Moments after I shoot them, I should say moments, the day after I shoot them, the night after I shoot them, I wanna look carefully and say, which one of these is the three worst worth keeping and keep it and get rid of the other two. Delete, gone, buy. Yeah, actually you bring up a good point. And that is just like getting better at calling through my images either mm -hmm. that night and really just getting rid of the stuff that I'm not gonna use or at least throw it in the trash and then dump it when I get home. Um, or when I get home from a trip, just, you know, and we teach this stuff all the time. And I'd like to say that in a perfect world, I practice what I preach every single day. But the truth is, I don't always. I do most of the time, uh, and I can teach best practices. And generally speaking, I adhere to that in my own life, but not always. I could always improve on that. Steve, you mean you're human? <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm very, very human. Very I'm, flawed human being. I'm right there with you, brother. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but you heard it here, 25,000. And you know what? You all are going to check in with me right after the Antarctica trip. And I'm going to sheepishly tell you that I have like 21,000 images. So, uh, you know, it's it's that's a big trip to start the year with. I'm sh going to be shooting a lot, but I'm going to try to be as mindful as possible. You're going to love it, man. I am. Uh, I can't wait to see your pictures from down there. I'm excited. All right. Hey, on that note, I think we're going to say good night to everybody. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching this and you're not already a Photo Enthusiast Network member, consider joining in 2019. We're here to help you become a better photographer in so many ways. Just go to take a moment. Go to photorec.tv slash join. You will see the full list of benefits that you can take advantage of. I think you'll be impressed. And uh, if you're already watching this and you're a member, thank you. We look forward to an awesome 2019. And if one of your goals is to build a new website, Remember that Squarespace is a great place to do it. Squarespace.com slash TV to save 10% off. And you can start your trial. Try it out. 10 days, I think, or seven days, completely free. And you don't even have to put in a credit card. Just there's no gotcha. If you try it out and then you forget, you know, a week later, they haven't charged you. You can decide if you want to continue or not. Squarespace.com slash TV. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. See we'll see you next week. I think. I'm pretty sure we will. Uh, yeah, I think so. We'll, uh, I'll talk to my people and have them call your people. Sounds good, Steve. All right, everybody. Have a great night.